Thank you, Thomas, for that nice introduction. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice being here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Paley. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am uh, presently a business advisor with the Small Business Development Centers. This is a private-public partnership between WSU um, and a number of other um, uh, institutions around the state. So we provide no-cost uh, business advisory services to, to companies. Um, and part of that um, opportunity gives companies a chance to, to get out and get some objective advice and get some support. Um, I have a different perspective um, as the presenter today. I wrote this curriculum because during the course of my professional experience, I've come across many companies that are struggling with the same issue, and that is how to get organized and how to tell their, their story. So I coined this phrase called the minimum viable story um, because I think that companies focus too much on product. They don't focus enough on what it is they want to do, how the entrepreneur needs to create that story, and what documents he needs or she needs to go ahead and be able to present something that's viable to stakeholders within that ecosystem. I also do uh, lead a course here with a number of other uh, instructors um, on the certification side. Um, it's an entrepreneurship course. Um, it will be offered in uh, January of 2017. So uh, a little bit about um, this, this workshop. A lot of people who are thinking about starting a business maybe have started a business already or they're kind of dipping into the water for the first time. So is there anybody here who's thinking about starting a business or has started a business already? Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. So one of the things that we don't do is we don't think about creating a written plan. We think about telling people about what we have um, up our sleeve, but we don't think about memorializing that in writing. Uh, a lot of times people are thinking about pitching to investors, um, but they're not ready. They think that because they see these, these TV shows and anecdotally they hear about people who are able to raise money effectively, um, they don't think about the work that goes into that process and how to create a viable business narrative so it actually makes sense to the people who they're trying to pitch to, or on the other hand, people who are looking to uh, get a secure loan from a bank, um, what the bank needs to see so it passes underwriting. So why did I create this, uh, this workshop? Um, so part of my background was I had founded a technology company in 1999, and before that I was a corporate lawyer. And as a corporate lawyer, we're always trying to put out fires. People who come to us after the fact or they were trying to start a business but didn't have any idea what they wanted to do. So people who I saw recently uh, as a volunteer for SCORE and now at the SBDC, people come in and they have these great ideas. And they've already jumped into the process. They may have started a, uh, a business by uh, going to trade shows. Uh, they may have started a business by filing for a license. They may have gone ahead and printed, uh, printed materials. Uh, they may have told their friends and family about their business idea. They may, may have gone ahead and already created prototypes or hired lawyers to develop and, or file patent applications. And it just gets to be uh, a very interesting conversation when we start from the, from the beginning and say, well, you've done all these things because you're in business, but what are you going to do in your business? And so part of the reason why I created this workshop was to get people to think it's not so much about the product, as I said, it's about how are you going to weave in a story, a compelling narrative that's going to engage your customer if you can't even talk about the story uh, without, uh, without uh, seeing customers. Um, what's also interesting is that I have people who have uh, already signed leases um, and are already um, you know, in, the, in the mix. Uh, please keep in mind that this is uh, an abbreviated version of a workshop that is normally about eight hours long. And so we're going to just take the, uh, the highlights <laughs> and, uh, and I'll get you to maybe think about um, uh, seeing us next time around. So, um, so some of the objectives. So I want us to think about the fact that we need a clear and a defensible story. And I don't mean creating fiction, but I mean linking our story into facts and into evidence that people can actually put in their hand and is tangible and it will demonstrate that we thought through this, this process. I also want you to think about this from, from the perspective of the listener. When I work with companies, I ask the founders or the business owners to think about who their audience is. 
because we need to step in those shoes and stand in those shoes to get a different perspective on what that conversation could be like. So if we're just thinking about this from the, from the founder's perspective, then it's very, uh, it's very uh, biased to achieving an outcome, but rather than taking that approach, what does someone need to hear to be engaged in your narrative, in your business story? What kind of questions are they gonna ask? And what questions would you ask if you were on that side of the table? Another part of, the, of this workshop also designed to get people thinking about how to create a plan for future growth. And so this isn't an overly complicated approach. It's just assembling some best practices and asking us to go ahead and think about how we would go ahead and create this chapter, if, if you will, approach to how we're going to explain our business idea. So the very first part of this, uh, of this idea is to think about how we're going to, how we're going to present it. And before we can present it, we have to ask ourselves some questions. And so I call this um, the heart questions. And the reason why I use this, this nomenclature is because in the course of my conversations with founders and people who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs, they always talk about what is, what is motivating them from, a, from an emotional perspective, which is great, right? They're passionate about what they want to do, but they don't think about the other side, which is the logical side, which sometimes we get overwhelmed with all the excitement of doing what we think is going to be successful, but we don't necessarily think about it. So the methodology that I want you to think about here is this process where I like you to think about where it is that you want to go in your business or your idea. So I want to take the destination and put that first. Okay? I'm not so concerned about why somebody wants to do something, but I want to know where they want to go with their idea. What objectives do they, do they want to fulfill? And then think about what it is that they need to do to get there. Okay? Then the third step is when do they want to do it? And so if time isn't pressing or it's not urgent, then they don't need to go ahead and start a business because they may not be ready. Maybe financially, maybe they need some extra training, they need some, some, more, uh, some more support or some more resources. So the when is the next part of this, of this heart question scenario. And then the next question I ask them is, who do you need on your team to fulfill your objectives? Now, the team member doesn't have to be someone with expertise. It could be a spouse or a partner or somebody who's going to go along for the ride, who's going to have to buy into your concept, into your idea. So as you think about these questions, work around the circle, but also know that at any one point in time, what we're ultimately trying to do is get to the question of how do we do this? Because the why, if you ask people why they want to start businesses or why they want to explore entrepreneurship, it's usually because it's just a financial motivation. Sometimes people have incredible ideas and they're really inspired to change things. But other times people just want the financial freedom or they want the time freedom to have a lifestyle business. And that's okay. So think about this in your own experience in business or in decisions that you make because if we can focus on the how, how do we tell our story? How do, how do we put the odds in our favor that we can have and increase the probability of having a successful outcome in our business. Any questions? There's only two parts of this. This is very, very simple. You're either gonna be selling a story or you're gonna buy an idea. And I want you to think about that. So if you think about who you need to engage in your conversation and your dialogue, think about the fact that you need to have people buy into that idea. Maybe it's a bank, maybe it's a venture capitalist, maybe it's an angel investor, okay? Maybe someone's even gonna submit a business plan to a competition. I want you to think about how you're gonna sell the story. And I want you to think about the other side of the table. We talked about perspectives. People need to buy the idea. I don't mean there has to be a financial transaction. There needs to be an emotional connection. We have to be able to relate to the people who, were, who are in our audience whether it be customers or bankers or stakeholders in our, in our organization. So a couple of working definitions, business story. I want us to think about the fact that we're creating a narrative and it's not an overly complicated narrative. We're not creating a magnum opus. Okay? This isn't going to be a symphony in, this, in, the, in, the, in the Mozart sense. 
but we need to be able to, to show people that we've taken our idea, we've developed it, and it has a logical nexus to the outcome. Because ultimately what we do in business is we connect with people. And we forget that as entrepreneurs and founders and business people. That connectivity is what's going to drive our business, drive our sales, and drive our success factor. Any questions? Just take a, the definition of this idea concept. Uh, something that we're going to do in business has got to be different. We know this intuitively or instinctively, but we don't do it. So how many times have you heard about people starting a business that has a competitor right across the street? But there's no value added proposition. And they do it without even thinking about it because their heart is so set on doing it, but they haven't asked the questions about how they're gonna get there. They just see, see themselves being in business. And they can go to their wine and cheese parties and rub elbows with their friends and say they're doing something in business, but does it really have the opportunity of being successful? And so think about the fact that we're trying to meaningfully disrupt. Now, that is an overused word, but we're trying to alter and change the status quo, if you think about it, no matter what business we're in. When I started my technology company, I had this idea to change something or to add something into the, into the Internet that didn't exist prior. And it was really hard. And I couldn't necessarily quantify it, but I knew that I had the attributes of a, of a successful business if I can disrupt it or change something, or test an hypothesis in business, okay, without a lot of expense and a lot, a lot of downside risk and see whether or not it would stick. Because ultimately, I needed to satisfy the expectations of my customers, although I didn't know who they were. I felt there was a pent up demand. And I proved that through this concept of the idea and how I was gonna walk that idea through its various stages. Our story needs to have a value prop. Okay, and so I want us to think about the fact that we need to deliver on the promise, whatever that's going to be. If you think about how the internet has commoditized expectations and commoditized the marketplace, everybody wants next day shipping, they want no sales tax, they want free returns, okay, and they want the cheapest price. So in our business narrative, if we're trying to craft a story, we need to think about the fact that the consumers have an expectation. And if our value prop doesn't mesh with what the consumer expects or the marketplace is giving us, then we're gonna have a real problem. So we really wanna make sure that the customer believes that there is value. Just ignore that at the bottom. Any questions about the value prop? So the execution. The hardest part about being a business is to make good on our promises to the people who are supporting us and also make sure that we can fulfill our objectives. So what I want you to think about here is as we begin to execute on our ideas that we think about how we're gonna manage the process. And what we're gonna talk about today is a very, very simple but yet effective way of how to manage that process. Because what we need to do as part of that planning is to think about systems and procedures we can put in place that are going to give us a greater likelihood of being successful. Any questions at all? Going too fast? <laughs> so there's three different documents that we're going to rely upon um, to go and uh, present our, our business case. And what I want to think about is the fact that we have this tool called an executive summary. But in the hundreds and hundreds of companies that I worked with, the founders or the business people haven't even thought about writing an executive summary. They're, they're drawn into the, to the, to the romantic view of pitching in front of investors or having someone hand them a wad of cash or money. So a executive summary, in my view, is one page. And it's not three pages or it's not five pages. And one of the hardest things that I think that we, we experience is balancing the time between the planning and running out of the gates quickly. But I'm gonna share with you a very, very simple approach to starting with an executive summary and then what we need to do to backfill that. 
we also need to think about a pitch deck. I don't mean a pitch deck for investors. I have my clients and the companies I work with create two different sets of documents. I want them to have an internal set and an external set because somebody who's going to be lending this, co this company uh, money or the company is going to be seeking investment from, uh, from third parties, they're going to want to see some documents, but they don't need to see everything on the first blush. So when you think about a pitch deck, a pitch deck can be organized so the, so the business owner has buy-in from his stakeholders, spouse or wife or husband, whoever that may be. The last part of the, of the core set of documents is the business plan. And this is a very, very controversial part of business planning. A lot of traditionalists believe that we need these business plans. So what's emerged is this whole line of thought about being efficient and using canvases to make that happen. But if you look at the canvases, the canvases already and generally assume that the founder has gone through the storytelling and, and, and narrative process. Because how can you identify your customer okay, in, a, in a canvas format if you haven't gone through the painstaking process of wordsmithing your narrative and having that vetted around those who can help you flesh out some of the ideas that are underpinning your assumptions about business. So think about the pitch deck, the documentation as being interchangeable and having two different, two different versions. Part of our narrative also requires that we have other collateral. Okay? And people say, oh, I have a website. That's great. Oh, I have a brochure. Well, that's great. Okay? But I'm talking about written documentation that supports your business narrative. And we'll talk about some of these in more detail, but we need some form of projections. And it's not back of the napkin. I mean, there's no more excuse that, uh, that worksheets aren't available because they're bundled with almost every computer sold today. Now, if people want to take their time to learn how to use those tools, that's, that's, that's another question. But we've oversimplified the process of starting a business by thinking we can do it on the back of a napkin. And there's some great books about that as well. But if I'm going to invest my time and my money into a business, or my clients are investing money, or they're foregoing opportunity, like opportunity cost, okay, I want to make sure that they put their time to their highest and best use. And so I try to infuse this, this discussion of economic terms in the process because people just think about starting a business and how much it costs with putting cash into the business. They don't think about all the other costs as well because they're hidden costs. And if you think about how, how much time it takes to put, in, to put into a business and grow a business, someone could be earning a salary, someone could be having a better quality of life, maybe spending time with children or loved ones or family members. So there's intangibles in this process. So what does the summary look like? In our executive summary, I want us to crystallize and capture our idea. I've had companies I've worked with that have literally gone through two dozen iterations of a one-page executive summary because it's really that hard. And that's why people don't like to do it. They want to go online, they want to pay $49 for a canned business plan and plug in some numbers and plug in some names and change the title and then present that to a bank. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, maybe that works on TV, but it doesn't work in real life especially now with banks having very, very strict underwriting criteria now, because now they're really nervous, like they were in 2008, about what could be the inflection point that's going to have this whole house of cards perhaps blow over. Think about also that in the executive summary, it is our narrative. It is our entire story. And you can say, well, how can you do that? You do that by planning and understanding the categories that we need to touch upon and make sure that we discuss so people can have uh, an idea of what we're doing and so we can instill a higher degree of credibility into that process. Sometimes the executive summary will be used to disclose information about the company. If we need to get buy-in from investors or we need to get buy-in from people who are on the outside, 
we want to tell them the strengths of our story and the weaknesses as well. We want to come clean with that process. Okay? One of the aspects of a summary that people don't think about doing is taking all of the financial pro formas or their financial projections and pulling them up in a summary format and really devoting three or four lines to it. Some people want to see, for example, angels and venture capitalists, they want to see a lot of detail. They want to see EBITDA, they want to see headcount, they want to see a little more level of sophistication about how that business is going to scale over a certain period of time. Maybe it's a five-year five -year time period. I just want us to think about capturing the high-level numbers. Let's just capture revenue and expenses and net profit before taxes. Let's just try that. When I start getting with clients into the discussion of taxes, I have clients who have these projections on the back of the napkin who don't even factor in B&O tax, for example. It's our state tax here for those who may be out of state. They don't factor in local taxes. And they think because they've been employees for their whole lives that their employer is going to pay the other 7.5 or 8%. So it's a rude awakening to think about the fact that people have this idea about what they're going to take home, but their expectations are way off. And they don't have any idea about the value of their time or the value of the business proposition. So we want a clear narrative. We want it defensible. So I want you to think of this as a, as a narrative. And I want you to think about a framework not only to solidify or memorialize your plans, but also weaving in a story of future growth as well. Because in those projections, implicitly embedded in that document, in that worksheet, is going to be your financial forecast for the next three to five years. And if you go to a bank or go to anybody with any investment sense, they're going to ask you to substantiate your assumptions. Okay? Any questions? So um, step one. So who's in business now? Please raise your hand. OK. So you don't have to answer this affirmatively, but ask yourself whether or not when you started your business, you were able to clearly summarize it in 20 seconds. I know I didn't, and I was not able to do that because I thought it wasn't important. And when people were to ask me what I was doing, I really struggled with trying to put together a coherent sentence because it was new technology, but it's also something I hadn't practiced. And so this is a very overused, it's a very trite thing to say, give me your elevator pitch, but how many of us can really do it effectively? And part of the workshop that we go into, that parts of the workshop we go into a little bit more detail is to help people actually get up in front of a group and work on their, their pitch, but also we have them write it out. And so what's not in this particular slide deck today is the detail where we actually walk through a case study and we walk through founders so they actually can see what it takes to put together a coherent executive summary. So start with the elevator pitch. I think the order is important. And so I like to know what the business summary is. I can't tell you how many business plans I read and people I talk to who are telling me that they have a business that is comprised of a product and a service, but they can't distinguish it. And then when I look at their, at their, at their worksheets to look at their financial projections, they don't even have them differentiated. So is the idea going to, is it going to improve something? Okay? And then part of the idea and part of that narrative, that three or four lines, is just telling us with, with some key words, what's the underserved market that we're actually trying to, trying to target? And who is it that's going to be our customer? How are we going to reach them? And this can all be done in, in, in about three, three or four sentences. But who really does that? Oh, it's easier to buy the canned business plan and to, and to just fill in the blanks. So after we create the elevator pitch, we need to have a summary. People don't think about the problem and the solution. They may talk about the problem, but they don't have any way to, to ameliorate the problem. And they haven't thought about in a way of explaining to people where they can quantify it. Again, I'm really a numbers guy. I love to hear business pitches, and I used to invest quite a bit in companies. And what, what's fun is to go back and see if the underlying business pitch 
or the story can actually relate to financial documentation and quantifiable projections. If we buy a business from somebody, then there hopefully is going to be some paper trail that we can at least vet or ask the business owner or seller whether or not those numbers are accurate or to defend those numbers. When we start our businesses, we don't do that though. We just assume that everything's going to fall into place and it doesn't work that way. So a couple of you know, key questions are, you know, how painful is this, is this problem? Do we really need another pizza parlor across the street? I don't know, maybe we do. Chuck E. Cheese did a great job, okay, and they were competing against Shakey's, but someone did their market research and figured out that there was a problem that wasn't being solved, because what do you do when you take a truck, truckload of kids to a pizza parlor and they have nothing to do for an hour and a half? You get out of there pretty quick, right? Also on the, on the solution side, who cares about this solution? Is there really a large enough audience to make this business or give this business a fighting chance of actually making, making money? And so with respect to understanding the market, we talk about that also in this, in this certification course. But we talk about how to figure out what the total addressable market is and what's the target market. Because people confuse those all the time. And they think, well, people care because I have 300 million consumers. But the fact of the matter is they haven't parsed out and really understood what is the value prop to their target audience and why would that target audience care about this problem, about this, about this pain point. I want to know what we're doing better. What is the value proposition that we're really going to confer? What are the benefits to the, to the consumer? We need to have some competitive advantage. Now, we know all these ideas and concepts, and maybe they're out there in, in fragments, but have we really thought about, again, committing those in writing and looking and surveying the marketplace and seeing who the competition is? Who's already doing this? There's our, there are some tools that we use at the Small Business Development Center that are really terrific resources and they have pretty good information that's gleaned and drawn from public census and other third parties. But ultimately, we need to go out and interview customers and see whether or not um, there are pain points with the customers that we can validate through our competitive advantage and our, our better product or our better service. So what do we do better? Who's in business now that wants to maybe answer what their competitive advantage is or what they perceive to be a competitive advantage? Anybody want to chime in? No, I'll just I'd really rather give you my 20-second elevator pitch and see if that covers <laughs> kind of the, A good pitch will cover that uh, advantage. I have the manpower and equipment to replace the strings of your tennis racket in a cost-effective, timely, competitive manner. That's it. And he's also an avid tennis player too, that's why he's using this <laughs> example. So I think my competitive advantage is quick turnaround, quality materials, and competitive prices. Because if you take it up to Dick's Sporting Goods, it's going to sit there four days and they're going to do it wrong 50% of the time. So how did I do on both the elevator pitch and competitor advantage, in your opinion? Good. And in this part of the, of the summary, I actually want names of companies here. I mean, I want us to actually flesh out, if we have a competitive advantage, I want to know who the, who the competition is and what they, are, what they are not doing. That's why I threw Dick's in. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So what I do with a lot of technology companies that I, that I work with, I force them to go ahead and dig beneath the surface and figure out who else is doing this. Because someone's doing it somewhere. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean... We know this. Did you want to add something, sir? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was that was great. Now, the first thing you said was, "I have the." Uh, I have the manpower and uh, equipment. Yeah, to uh, string to, to repair your tennis racket strings. Yeah, and the okay. last and the last part was with the three things, with quality materials, quick turnaround, yeah. competitive price. Does he need to include competitive price in that statement? Because um, he's providing a quality a service that is is fast, but it's high quality, better than the competition. Does he need to say competitive price? What do you think? I don't think so. Because I, th I don't think the average tennis player is that concerned about the price. What they want, they love to play tennis, they want a, a racket that's done right. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think you do. I like the competitive price. Cause Look it, over here, that's a great conversation. Yeah. Please, go ahead. I, I think you do because they always have the adage, you get what you pay for. Yeah. And people always say it all the time. 
but you have to remind someone because people think, oh, I'm getting high quality and like this. But I don't want. Am I? Is it worth how much more am I paying? But if you could say, look, it really doesn't cost much more than Dix does, but I'm giving you twice the service. I think it's a huge selling point. Or next day turnaround rather than waiting three or four next days, day yeah. right? So think about that. Thanks for sharing, gentlemen. So think about this in the context of a of a technology startup. Okay, I mean. People start companies, they leave large software companies up in Seattle and other places, right? They have great expertise, domain expertise we call it, so they may be great computer programmers, okay? May have managed teams, but they don't even understand what the competitive landscape is or how to do that because that analysis is never part of their job, right? Their job is to develop product. Their job is to, is, is to, is to produce widgets, okay? Have teams that function efficiently. But this is very hard to do. And so luckily with the birth of the internet, we have a lot of resources. And so for, for tech companies, I point them to a couple of resources online that not only talk about and name the investors, but they also name the valuation, talk about valuation. They talk about how much was, how much was raised and they give a really great profile about that business. That's easy to do if you have the resources. For offline businesses or non-technology companies, we have access to the other resources that make it really easy because we can pull information data and as long as we put the relevant data in, we get good information out. But think about also the competitive advantage because what we also do is we create these, these matrices and we really need to see where our value prop intersects within that marketplace. And so whichever quadrant we actually land in, that's going to be dictated by who else out there is doing it. And then that only also gives us an opportunity to further differentiate what our value prop is and where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the competition. Market need an opportunity. When we form our businesses, I know when I formed my business, I was concerned about who the, who the customer was because the marketplace was so new that everybody was jumping online. In fact, there wasn't, unfortunately, any browsers, there was dial-up, and so there was so much pent-up demand that all we had to do was to be able to leverage a decent product because there was no competition, okay? And that was our value prop, and we were able to attract hundreds of millions of users to our network just organically because we had really great, um, great uh, content and we had great services that people wanted. I didn't know who my, who my customer was, but I was in a very, very different, different marketplace. I know who it is now, and so over time we changed the, the orientation of our, of our business more toward a travel and hospitality play rather than just an online uh, meeting place where people would congregate. Think about your business as well. Who's your customer now, but who's a customer in six months from now or two years from now? because a lot of people don't think about that. If we think about the buying habits of millennials or different generations, we're in a multi-generational workforce and also in a consumer space, think about the, life, the lifespan of our product and whether or not the customer actually is gonna be able to be there or is there to purchase or acquire what we're, what we're selling. So I want us to quantify the demand. I want us to talk about what the, what the need is. So we're going through this process systematically and we're identifying these hotspots, these trigger points for a more clear discussion. People get this confused and they overcomplicate what we're talking about here. When we hear go-to-market strategy, I just want to know how we're going to connect. That's all I want to know. Maybe we're going to take, um, take out and buy um, um, advertising um, online. Maybe we're going to go ahead and hand out uh, flyers at trade shows. Maybe we're going to go ahead and put um, pieces of paper underneath people's windshield wipers. Maybe we're going to go to meetups and network with people who have like-minded interests or our prospective customers. I want to just know how we're going to acquire our first customer, and we need to know how we're going to acquire the next set of customers because we have to be able to grow. Okay, and so again, think about the fact that we're in a very unique situation in our economy where we have so many people of different generations who are ready to buy. And if we're not focusing on our target market and just the overall market, we're gonna really waste a lot of time and spin our wheels. So I want us to write out longhand in a couple sentences how we're gonna connect and how we're gonna connect 
before we go live because a lot of the work in business and startups we overlook because we could be doing recon before we get started, right? We don't want to just do trial and error. And again, in my situation, it's very, very different. We really want to be able to do the research and figure out how we're going to not only when we launch acquire customers, but the customer acquisition strategy and how we tie that into our financial statements will dictate our overall narrative. So, yes. Uh, on your market, uh, go to market, you know, because uh, the world's changing so rapidly. Back in the old day, you know, face to face is really critical, building relationships, you know, that's why. You know, the old terminology, the banks always have to go out for a double martini lunches and you, you develop a relationship. Now, the new generation is like, I don't have time for that. Just email me. I mean, what are you seeing out there in the market? How, how uh, potential entrepreneurs should go out to market? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great, great question. So what I'm seeing is this whole concept of, I'll call it super organic. So because of the generational difference in consumer habits and the comfort level of face-to-face -face contact or how they're going to actually consummate a business transaction, what happens is people aren't thinking about how to go ahead and drip out information to the target audience so that they're familiar with the, with the product or service, but also that we can convert them somehow. And so depending on, on, on your target market or depending on uh, what product or service you're offering, I think that'll dictate how you're going to go ahead and reach out to your, to your customers. So I was at a trade show yesterday um, for the Immerse Summit up in, up, in, uh, up in Bellevue. The Immerse Summit is a summit uh, for virtual, virtual reality and augmented reality, so VR, AR. It's a cutting edge new way of entertainment, but there's also a way now with virtual reality we have a lot of people who are trying to sell products and services into that marketplace. And so I met with a company yesterday that had an interesting um, idea about how to display billboards on businesses through um, animation and through virtual reality or AI, um, artificial intelligence. And his whole market approach was to go ahead and to go to trade shows and go to these uh, symposiums about technology and then hopefully have a CMO or have somebody in the audience that likes the technology buy into it and then grow up uh, on, a, on a grassroots basis. Many companies I'm working with have to have ad budgets and they can't afford to grow organically because it takes too long and they don't quite know how to do that. So I think depending on the business, um, it'll dictate how you're gonna go ahead and go to market. Answer your question? Thank you. The revenue model. I have make in parentheses. How are we going to make, make money? Um, how are we going to convert those customers um, and have them part not only of our initial buying sequence, but also subsequent? A lot of entrepreneurs and business owners don't think about the repeat customer. And the data shows that getting the, first, getting the customer in for the, for the first time, that's the easy part. Where all the leverage comes in our, in our business is having repeat customers. But yet people who are forming businesses just assume they're gonna have this indefinite wave of new customers and the new customers are gonna keep their business going indefinitely. Well, it doesn't work that way. So it's a great recent study by Forrester that actually went through this process and analyzed what it is from a business proposition standpoint as the most ROI, the highest ROI to a company. And that ROI, that return on investment, needs to focus on repeat customers. Because the data showed that the repeat customers on the second buying cycle actually bought more than the first time customers did on the first cycle. So some interesting data points to think about. So in our narrative, if we're going to go to a bank or go to investors and present our pitch or idea, we need to be able to at least let them know that we see the issue and that if they ask, well, what's your, what's your strategy going to be to get repeat customers, okay, we don't, uh, we don't uh, look at them with blank, with blank faces and not know how to answer that because the data shows that if we don't incorporate into our revenue model how we're going to reach the repeat customers, we're leaving a lot of money on the table with our valuation or our business prop. But also think about this. I met with a client a couple days ago. This client has a very fascinating technology. 
the, co the, the company has raised about $600,000. And they are in the process now of going out for, ve for venture capital. So they started with angel investors, and now they're going on to, to institutional money. Okay? So we're sitting down talking about this, this, these business models, and he has some financial um, projections. Uh, we're analyzing these projections, and he has a five-year projection set. And I asked him, I said, uh, well, this is great, but I just see numbers, you know, mathematically increasing, and they're all the same, and it looks like we're just plugging in some assumptions into your revenue models, because now he's trying to raise about two and a half to three million dollars. So I said, You're, you have the numbers that are, that are changing, but they seem to change every quarter. They seem to be right on track, so every quarter I just look at the month and the number goes up proportionally, right? And I asked him, I said, how are you going to, how are you going to account for the fact that you're going to have churn? And he said to me, what's that? So, you know, the fact of the matter is that here he is going out. He's already raised a lot of money. He's a very knowledgeable, very sophisticated programmer. But he forgot about this one missing element is to instill the highest degree of credibility to that narrative. He needs to be able to tell people that he has considered the possibility that he's not going to have 100% retention of all of his customers. Now, if you think about going out into the marketplace and, raise, and raising capital, and that business was uniquely tailored to a high churn rate because it's an online business. But if you think about the online business, how would you feel, other side of the table, if someone was asking you to give or invest money into a business, and you were a sophisticated investor, and you were looking at, at financial assumptions and projections that didn't take into account the fact that you had a high turnover business, but you weren't accounting for the loss or the leakage on your, on your revenue. These are simple, common sense concepts, but they're rarely incorporated into the business narrative and into the worksheets. So for your own business, just think about that. When you started your business, do you have a business where there's a potential for high customer turnover? And if you do, have you taken into account that you're maybe basing projections on increasing numbers, not looking at the fact that we should have a separate line item on the revenue side for repeat customers, okay? And also an assumption and using some comments within that, that worksheet that talk about your assumptions about how much leakage you're going to have with customers either not renewing or not, not repeating. Uh, based on the, uh, the performa, the forecasting, uh, do you like seeing revenue, just revenue, because um, I, can't, I guess my question is, how detailed do you want the revenue section to be? Because um, there's, it can be multiple revenue streams that come in. You know, when you go to a car dealership, they can sell you cars, but revenue can come from car sales and service, then all the other stuff that goes along with it. Do you, I guess two parts of the question, do you like to see that in a performa? And also, do you talk about that initially with potential entrepreneurs regarding multiple revenue streams? I do. So uh, that's, a, that's a really great, great question, Thomas. So I always start on the expense side. I don't start on the revenue side. I don't care about the revenue because entrepreneurs and founders have limited resources, right? And so if they don't understand their cost structure, then they can't build into a revenue model because they may not be around in six months. So it's almost, it's almost a paradox. We always start with, with, with the bottom line. Really, how much is it going to cost to start the business and how much is it going to cost to grow it, okay? And do you have enough, enough staying power, enough tread on the tires to actually roll through the first year? On Thomas's question about revenue, yes, I require that these, that these, that these clients go through and I want to break out every single revenue stream because there are different baskets of opportunities. And what that does for us as founders is it crystallizes in our mind our value prop and what is our most competitive product because the margins are gonna differ product, product to product. And so if we don't see those in front of us in a, in a spreadsheet, we're gonna have a real problem. It's gonna be a real surprise. So many of the companies I work with, they lump everything together and they don't break it out. And you can say, well, it's a pro forma, it's, it's an assumption, um, you know, no one's going to look at it. They are going to look at it. I had a client um, recently who um, was successful in raising um, institutional money, so um, a VC-backed business. 
Um, it was not super high tech, called medium tech. And uh, this person had a really great revenue model. He did not start with the expenses. And so happened, what happened with this particular project was there was a line item on the expense sheet that the investors didn't catch. And what they didn't catch is in his business narrative, his revenue model took into account the fact that he was going to use some of the investment proceeds to repay a loan that he put into the company, but he characterized it, maybe innocently, as, a pay, as paid in capital. So he went and started a business, okay, with investors who were very sophisticated, thinking that he was going to contribute cash to the business, okay, and that he would get stock or equity over time out of that investment. And what happened was the narrative got a little confused, the terminology was juxtaposed, and he actually was making a loan to the company because he had an SBA loan and he wanted to get the loan repaid. And when he asked me to invest in the company, I said, I don't feel comfortable doing that because this has a huge impact on your monthly cash flow statement. So people did not understand that their narrative wasn't even vetted. You had some very sophisticated people investing because they were romanticized by the opportunity. Mm -hmm. The founders were very, very successful. And maybe it was noise. But to me, I think the variance was about 5 to 7%. And that's huge in the early years because there wasn't enough working capital to grow the business. Because if you backed out the, the spend on advertising and trade shows and marketing, there wasn't enough there. How are we doing on time? We've got about 10 minutes. Great. Um, growth and scalability. I want us to address um, how we're going to grow and scale this business. I want to know um, what assumptions we are thinking about uh, to get to the next level. One year is easy projections. Five years may be too long. But depending on the business, I want the founders to think about what's year two and three going to look like and how are we going to get there. So factor in the churn, factor in also the fact that we may have multiple product lines, factor in that we want to be able to monetize repeat customers, and we have a really great value prop. Eight, management team. Even if we're solo, even if we're sole, sole proprietorships, we still have a management team. We have a spouse. We have somebody, a partner. We have somebody who we're going to have to, be, we're going to, have to account to, and they're part of our team. Okay? This is traditionally used for companies trying to raise capital. But what we do here is the management team for the, for, the, for the founder, if that management team is not buying a business, so there's an incumbency within that organization where there's shared knowledge that could be passed down from owner to owner, if you don't have that kind of situation, you have a lot of companies being started by people who have great siloed experience. Okay? But when they go to a bank, the bank's going to say, unless you have collateral, I'm not going to do the loan. And by the way, even if you have collateral, I've had clients turn down with SBA loans because they don't have experience that's relevant to their business, notwithstanding their credit. So once you think about how that works in your, in your, in your proposition. The financials, um, this is the flow. Um, I really want us to think about how we're going to go ahead and not only create the story from the 10 elements or nine elements of our executive summary, all fits into one page, but how the financials are going to flow as well. So part four, the supporting cast, keeping uh, thematically consistent um, with, the, with the story. Um, a couple of things I want to think about. We need to have models and create snapshots. And so I'm a firm believer in this whole exercise of creating these financial projections because without them, our business means nothing. I also want to think about the fact that if we're going to start a business, I use this terminology very loosely. I call it use of proceeds. What I'm saying is we're going to start with a certain amount of money. Okay? And how are we going to draw down that money? Maybe it's 25000 and that's okay. But wouldn't it be nice to be able to know what percentage of that drawdown is going to be used to pay rent and just give us some checks and balances so before we go ahead and sign the lease or go out to the trade show to Las Vegas that we know how much it's going to cost and what proportion of our pie is going to be spent on that expenditure? I had a client a couple of years ago who wanted to start a clothing company. Microsoft executive, director level, D level. Wanted to start a clothing company for women. Went and uh, paid a consultant to write the business plan, went ahead and created uh, a business where she had the business license, 
She had the corporate structure. She had someone come in and create the, the logo for the, for, the, for the clothing. And then she went to Las Vegas to a trade show, not for the hangover. And she went to Las Vegas to a trade show, and I think she spent $10,000 bringing down all the goods, all the wares, staying at the hotel, paying the entrance fee. She didn't even have a business plan, and she was just putting money into the company every month from her paycheck because she was making a lot of money. So what I told her to do was, let's go ahead and start out assuming you have just a fixed amount because you're not a bank, right? You're not going to give this, to this company indefinitely. How much money are you going to cap out on your initial, on your initial spend and where is that spend going to go? And how long are you going to be able to use that money before you have to make a decision about either to pivot in the business or to change the business model? The income statement and balance sheet, again, more, for, more, more accounting. But if we're buying a business or we're thinking about a franchise, we need to understand the fact that there's, our, there's complex agreements and documents that the accountants and that uh, stakeholders are going to want to see. And we need to understand and have a working knowledge of some of these terms. Planning ideas. I love milestones. We actually create project plans with my clients. We actually go through and create, we tie a timetable to an outcome. And we do that for about a year. And I don't care if they derivate from the plan, but I want them to have a plan. I want them to be able to articulate and, tell back and, and say back to me what it is they're trying to do within a certain time frame. I also like the idea of accountability. What's really nice about the Small Business Development Center is that this service is another degree of accountability, another layer of accountability, so founders and business people can have and talk to someone who is objective, who has no vested interest in their business except, except to see them successful. And so that's a really great resource. There's other resources out, out in the community, such as SCORE. Um, I'm impartial to the Small Business Development Center. Um, but I think that both organizations have wonderful resources as well as the SBA. Any project requires that we have SMART goals. I didn't invent the acronym, but we really need to have specific goals and they have to be measurable. You know, we really need to have these action points and do things within certain, certain time frames. And in my longer workshop, we actually have templates that we give to participants that actually requires them before, that, before we end that session or that day that they actually create a couple of goals. So in conclusion, please create a roadmap. If you know someone who's starting a business, have them create a roadmap and have them make sure that they start to understand and have an appreciation for the business models. Again, this isn't overly complex, but it's something that needs to be organized and orchestrated. Please, before you start a business or anybody else you know, please walk before you run because never invest more money than you can afford to lose. That's, uh, that's the, the takeaway. I want to thank University of Washington Tacoma. I want to thank everybody for coming here today. Special thanks to Thomas Kiljam of Vibe for allowing me to speak today. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach me. My email address is available on some of the materials I'll hand out. And thank you for coming today. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. Wow.